When you preach at Christmas time, uh, sometimes it uh, can be a challenging time because there's the same story every year, it never changes. And um, because we, I think, have a temptation to take it for granted and forget about some of the uniqueness and specialness of the story of Christ, we can sometimes just kind of sit there and think about what we're going to do on Christmas Eve or what we're going to do Christmas Day or where we've got to be after church and, and those kind of things. But God really put on my heart this week uh, the significance of the wise men and the role that they played in, in this story. And as I've tried to learn a little bit more about um, these men that came uh, from the East to visit Jesus, several things that well, there's a lot of things scholars don't agree on, but several of the things that they do agree on are that, one, they were from a priestly caste, probably from the Persian Empire uh, or from the Persian, Assyrian, and Babylonian Empire, each of them coming from a different place. And I think that their, that belief is because of the nature of the gift that they gave. Each of the frankincense and the golden myrrh were traded uh, and, and mined and, and produced in those countries. And, and so uh, by no means is that... Uh, a for sure thing, but it's likely that because of the gifts they gave, that's where they're from. And I think it is fascinating that these three uh, priestly leaders from these different nations, somehow, even though um, the idea of Jesus was not part of their religious uh, belief system, they recognize the significance of the star that God revealed to them. And they set upon them the task of, of the journey uh, of coming to Bethlehem to see Christ. And I think one of the things that that says to me is that the significance of Christ and what he did goes beyond our small world. What we think about who God is, who Christ is, what we think about what Christmas is and, and the holiday season, that it permeates and goes way beyond all of those things that it was a, a divine act of God in the fulfilling of His work, of His creation, of His purposes. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like uh, for you to turn to Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to look at some of the specific details of this story of the wise men coming. Because wisdom, I think, uh, at least the perception of wisdom, is, is something that's highly valued in our culture. We spend a lot of time... Uh, seeking after knowledge because we believe that it is a means to an end uh, to gaining different things uh, understanding, money uh, power, authority, influence uh, freedom and so because of that uh, I think there is a, a path that our culture believes in but I, I think that it is a misguided path that oftentimes what we perceive that we are seeking uh, being wisdom is actually uh, worldly knowledge and we confuse those things and at the end of that path lies either destruction or, or true wisdom and there's a character that we'll read about Herod and I think he, he is a an example for us of an unwise man you know if there were three wise men in the story I think he is our example of an unwise man and we'll talk more about what I mean by that here in a minute but let's take some time and read this it's a long uh, passage uh, but that's okay. You're kind of uh, at my mercy at this moment. Unless you get up and leave. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. And so he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. Now, you need to understand why this is disturbing, okay? Herod thinks that he's the king, not just like a king, but the king. And um, he is really Rome's representative uh, there, kind of like a governor in a way, although Rome had its own governor over that area. But Herod was kind of the uh, local governor, the person that the Jews respected more or less, uh, and, and he was a Jew himself, at least by uh, his own uh, statements. I'm not sure that he probably 
lived a Jewish life or by any means lived under the law of the, of the covenant. But he certainly uh, was the, the man in charge. And so when it says Jerusalem with him, uh, Jerusalem, of course, was the, the capital city there, the main city. And so his, um, I guess we could say his puppets or, or the people that had authority and money and wealth because of him, you know, his friends, basically, uh, they were all disturbed, of course, because that would be a challenge to his leadership. So he is going on in verse 4. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes and asked him where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. That was a quote from the Old Testament. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I can go and worship him. All right, so what Herod does is he doesn't know where Jesus is exactly, but he knows that the wise men, you know, or these three guys from far, far away have showed up. And because it, notice it says unexpectedly earlier on there, so they showed up, and he knows that something big is going on. And apparently the, some of the scribes and the, the, chief, the priests and the religious leaders figure out that the prophecy uh, you know, might be talking about Jesus or the Messiah, I guess specifically the Messiah in this case. And so he wants to use the, uh, manipulate the wise men to get to him, all right? Because his agenda is not a good agenda. And so he wants to manipulate and use them, and then he lies to them. All right, that's a lie there. It's, he says, so that I can go and worship him. All right, when all along, he's planning to do what? Kill him. That's right. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star that they had seen in the east. And it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. And entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Now I think it's fascinating that these men were warned, I believe, by the Lord in some way, or a messenger in this dream. And so God went outside of what we might perceive of you know, God's people, Israel, to accomplish his purposes. And I find that fascinating. And I think there is a, a perhaps hidden, perhaps not so hidden message here for us and that we need to recognize that God's purposes are bigger than our own small lives. And I don't say that in a mean spirit or discouraging way, like, oh, your life's so small and insignificant. By no means is that the case. But that sometimes we get so wrapped up in our life in our world and, and what we need and how things are that we forget that God's purposes are much bigger than ours. A lot of people in ministry, you know, they, when they, they, they get excited, they, they believe they've received a call and, and, and God's, you know, has, has a, a work that he wants to do through them and they kind of get excited and, and they go out and just start doing stuff that sounds good, that maybe some cool person like Francis Chan or David Platt or you know, whomever you think is cool, uh, you know, is doing. And, and they kind of get wrapped up in their own small world. And as you get, then you get down the road a while and that some things fail and you're like, man, okay, you know, where did I go wrong? And hopefully, eventually, at the end of that journey, you realize that God is already at work. He is already at work uh, working out his purposes in, the, in, in life, in the world. And it is our role as Christian leaders, as Christians, as people that follow Christ, to find where that is, to see where that is, and to go there and to, to join up with God in what He's doing. You see the difference? Instead of us trying to control and try to, out of us saying, okay, well, you know, I want to serve God, but here's my parameters. I need it to be air conditioned and heated. I need there to be plumbing and, and water, and, and it needs to not be like murky and yucky. It needs to be nice, clean, purified water from a bottle. And, and you know, it's like, it's like the rock stars, you know, when they have a concert, you got to have like 10 lukewarm. Uh, cups of water and ten, you know, cold cups of water and like four towels and you know they have all these things and so we we try to dictate to God how we're going to serve Him. You see, and, and in in, the, in that statement, it's all about us. 
We try to make Christmas all about us sometimes. And what we want to do and what we have planned and where Christmas is really all about God and what He has planned. I mean, can you imagine when, and we'll talk about this more in the next few weeks, but when Jesus had died, He'd been resurrected from the dead, He appeared to the apostles, and He sent them out. There are more people in this room today, all right? And we're, we had 100, I think, almost last week, and we're probably half of that today. But even as small as our group is today, we have, there are more people in this room that are believers than that were assembled there in that upper room. And I find it fascinating that God accomplished His work of millions of people being changed from that handful of people. He didn't need a worldwide thing to happen. It just started small. Uh, this week has, you know, of course, been a, a very exciting week for us. We uh, finally realized, um, because of the Lord's provision, our dream of having a farm or a ranch, I guess more uh, specifically, so we're going to have livestock. And uh, so, you know, we, we closed Thursday morning, and, and we got excited, and we went out and, and worked our rear ends off trying to get it ready, and it looks like we've done almost nothing uh, after all of that. But uh, there is this huge, and I'm talking like the trunk is this big, oak, massive oak tree that lightning hit six months a year ago or so, and it's just kind of split in half, and it's just laying down. And, and you can see it from a mile away. It's just that big. And so I've been out there with a the chainsaw cutting it up, and the kids have been helping. Stephanie and my dad came out, and Stephanie's dad came out at different times, and we've been trying to get this thing chained up. And, what, and if you uh, know anything about oak trees, that's, you know, the little acorn you know, seeds, you know, we, everybody calls them different things. They have the little head and then the little seed in there, and that's what seeds an oak tree. And... So you know those, either you deliberately buried in the ground, six inches or so, or they fall on the ground, and over time they sprout and grow, and it takes like 50 years, a very, very large, big tree. And as I saw, and the kids are kind of collecting them because we've got a, an area where, uh, where some of the trees have been cut down and logged, and so we're going to replant those and let them grow so that when their grandkids are uh, grown up, you know, they'll have massive giant oak trees, hopefully, if we still own that land then. And it, it reminded me, all I could th every time I saw one of those little guys, it reminded me of how God works. He starts with the smallest of things, the things that seem insignificant. I mean, you can take a hammer and just crush those acorns into nothing. You know, it just seems so small and fragile. It's not moving. It's not doing anything. It's just this tiny little seed. But yet from it grows a great power. I mean, there's enough wood in that one oak tree to heat our house for all winter long, at least, and probably then have some left over. And it is amazing how God takes those things and he multiplies them. He makes something from it. I think that's why we have all these stories like the loaves and the fish in different ways that Jesus took a small thing. And so I think for us, as we, as we take a look at this and we look at the treasures, we look at the, gift that the, the gifts that the wise men left there. And we see how small and insignificant this beginning seems to be at this time. God had a huge plan that he was working out. And the players that were part of this, I don't think that perhaps any of them knew fully the, the significance of their involvement in that plan. And yet God used them. Let's go on in verse 13. After they were gone, they being the wise men, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up and take the child and his mother. Flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and escaped to Egypt. And he stayed there until Herod's death, so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. Another quote from the Old Testament. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. Work of the flesh, right? Anger, rage, malice. He gave orders to massacre all the male children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. And then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. 
A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be consoled, because they were no more. And after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, because those who sought the child's life are dead. And so he got up, and took the child and his mother, and entered the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the region of Galilee. And he went and settled in a town called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. You know, at the time, I, I, I can imagine that Mary and Joseph both, and, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to show that video today during intercessory prayer time, I'm sure there was an emotional roller coaster ride as they lived that out. I mean, it's easy for us. We, we know exactly what happened. We can look back on it from a historical perspective and say, this happened and this happened, and you know, God appeared to them at this time, and God appeared to them at this time. But to live that out in real life, that, that would be rough. I mean, what if God appeared to you in a dream and said, oh, someone's going to try and kill your child. You need to go to Arkansas and stay there for three years. You, know, you need to go to Montana and... I mean, can you imagine what that would be just to up and leave everything and just to go and, and then to come back? You know, you get there, you kind of get settled in, and now you're coming back again. And to rely on God and to wait on God through all of that, I think God chose wisely when He chose Mary and Joseph because He knew that they would be faithful. Because frankly, many of us, we are not faithful. We're not faithful to wait on God. We take matters into our own hands because we don't want to wait for God to work out His purpose. We want to kind of force God's hand. We want to manipulate God. And who does that sound like? It sounds like Herod, right? Have you ever thought of yourself as being like Herod? You know, he's the bad guy in this story. We always look at ourselves and, and compare ourselves to him and go, oh, well, you know, that's not me. I'm not like that. And probably not to that extent by any means. I mean, that's a pretty horrible thing to do, murdering all of those babies toddlers. But I think there are, there are several things that we can learn from each of these groups, and I want to highlight those from the story. First, from the, wi the wise men. It cost them something to follow the star. I mean, we don't know how long it took, a, a, quite a while, months uh, at least, for that journey. So they had to sacrifice a leave, and apparently these are fairly wealthy, prominent people. So it's not like, well, I don't have anything better to do, so I'll just go on walkabout and check this star thing out. All right, they're probably people of influence. Uh, they probably had great lands and, and slaves and servants to, to take care of and administrate, and yet they left that, all of that to come and to follow the star. Second, um, they listened and they learned in a lot of different ways. I mean, one, they, I mean, just coming, making that sacrifice, but when they arrived, they, what, what did they do? What does the Bible say? They kneeled down and presented their gifts. They humbled themselves. And I, I think really, in a sense, these are characteristics of great leaders. A great leader humbles himself before others. He doesn't demand, like Herod, you know, to be the king, to insist that I'm the king, it's by divine right, you know, do what I say or else. You know, they have a, a humble spirit, a, 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 and that comes from, I believe, sacrifice, that when we... Um, we take that step of sacrifice that leads us on the path of humility. And then that helps us do the third thing, really, that we see in the wise men, is they accomplish God's will. And I don't, I don't know about you, but at Christmas time, I don't necessarily think about the Christmas story being a message of God's will. But in a sense, it is. It is the path, it is the plan, it is the... The, the right and correct way for us to, to look at and learn from to accomplish God's will in our lives. Because there's a clear message on how we're to follow God and how we're not to follow God through Herod and through the wise men. And so I think uh, if, we're, if we are humble and if we are shrewd and we are truly seeking wisdom, then we will understand the principles and the lessons here. Now sometimes, um, you know, I, I think it's good to define terms and uh, maybe I should have done this a little bit earlier. But there, there is a significant distinction between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is, is simply gaining information. 
All right, so let's say um, you, know, you want to learn how to sew. And so you go out and you get a book or you watch a video series or something like that, and then you gain knowledge about how to sew. Now, when you sit down to actually sew with the sewing machine and all those things, it's not quite as easy as what it sounded like when you were watching the videos. Right? All right? Some ladies and maybe a couple guys can uh, attest to that. All right? It's not quite as easy as it sounds. All right? So what was lacking there? Why was it hard? Why could you not just watch a video series? And the same applies to everything. Woodworking, farming, you know, business. And all, you know, what, what was the difference? Well, you're lacking one component, and that is experience. And so for those of you who like clean formulas, you, can, you could say that experience plus knowledge equals wisdom. But knowledge alone leaves us lacking something. And so I think as we, as we talk about wisdom and understanding, there is a component for us that we have to experience this. We can't just sit here and hear it or read it on Christmas Eve when we have our family gathering or whatever we do, the story of Jesus, the story of Christ, the story of the Messiah but we have to, it has to be a part of who we are. It has to be something that we are living out, that we are actively engaged in God's purposes being accomplished through us. Let's look at Herod for a minute. Herod was greedy and selfish. And that was the, the, the root of terribleness. I know, that's an amazing word to use, right? That everything fell apart from. It was the foundation that collapsed, that, that led everything that happened, I mean, all, I, mean I, I can't imagine being a, a, a parent in that situation and uh, experiencing that. I, that must, I, I, I didn't even want to try to begin to say that I could understand that situation. But, but because of Herod's greed and his selfishness, he didn't want anyone else to be king. He didn't want to share his authority, his power, his wealth. He lacked humility. He lacked wisdom. And because of that, he tried to manipulate God. And that's really the ultimate. If you, if you look at that and, and you ask, well, where did that greed, where did that selfishness lead? It led him to try to manipulate God. He tried to use the wise men. He tried to use all the soldiers to, because whenever the wise, because that was, that was plan number one. Plan A was wise men are going to rat Jesus out, and he's going to go and find him and take him down. Well, that failed, then he went to plan B. Plan B as well, I'll just wipe out every baby in Bethlehem and we'll go from there. So that greed and that selfishness led him to try to, to play God, to manipulate God. He decided, whoa, I don't want this Messiah to, to come, I'll just take him out. He heard all the people around him and he modeled for all of eternity poor leadership. Because even as, as we look back at history, and, and any uh, historian in any sense would, could say that the, the primary role of a king or a queen or, or a governor is to protect the people. That's the, the prime, their primary goal. And with greed and selfishness, that protection turned into harm. That power was abused and it became damaging. And I believe that we have the exact same choice in our life. We can go down either of those paths. And then it starts either with an act of selfishness and greed, or it starts with an act of sacrifice and humility. Because all the things that happen from there, those are really just uh, sprouts of what was planted in the beginning. I think we can look at... Um, some villains, perhaps, we might say in history. People like Adolf Hitler and the Roman Emperor Nero and uh, you know, the list goes on. People that did a lot more harm in the world than good, certainly. But when you look at it, and you know, sometimes we say, oh, well, you know, these people are the devil or whatever. But when you look at it, they're just people, just like you and me. They were born, they had a mom. But somehow on that path of life, they made a choice to go down a path of darkness, 
path of selfishness and hate and evil. And I know that in my life, it's not any time that I have struggled with sin or I've made unwise choices. It, it started with something small. It wasn't like I just woke up one day and I was like, man, I, I just want to I just want to hurt somebody. I just want to cause somebody grief and pain and turmoil. You know, it, it, it came out. It usually started with this selfishness, something small or, or seemingly small. And, and, and I wanted something, or I, I wanted to do a certain thing, and, or I wanted to control something, or I didn't like something. And so it started off small, but then as I got for deeper and deeper and deeper in, into that and down that path, it just got darker and darker, and there were more problems and more problems. It's kind of like uh, at lying. Uh, you know, you start out with one small lie, and then you've got to come up with another lie to cover that lie, and then you've got to come up with a whole set of lies to take care of that line. Pretty soon you're just down this path of just a complete lie. And everything is crazy. But it started with just the one lie. And I think that for us uh, as Christians, we might, again, look at this story and say, oh, well, you know, I would never you know, murder all those babies. I would never, you know, let something like the Holocaust happen. I would never, you know, you fill in the blank. I would never persecute, murder, crucify thousands of Christians. But it doesn't start with those things. That's the end result. The Bible says that we are the, the light on a hill that can't be hidden, that we are the salt and the meat that keeps it from rotting. And I believe that it is the actions that we take to sacrifice, to humble ourselves, to serve others, to gain true wisdom, that those, those small acts in the moment, they lead us down a path that changes the world. We can look at people like Martin Luther. Uh, we can look at many, many, many good people, the apostles, Augustus, um, you know, others that Paul, that changed the world for good. And the, the, the impact of what they did, we still see that today. But it, was just a, it started with just a small act of obedience. A small act of making a decision to do something good, to do something right. And God used that and He multiplied that. And I think the truth of that, it's not like, again, we set out to do a great thing. I think it's when we set out to decide that we were going to be a part of what God was already doing. Part of His plan. I think it is fairly amazing that all of these prophecies made at different times became true and were lived out through Christ and through the apostles. And what's particularly interesting to me, because I, I uh, am a little bit of a skeptic, and when I was in college, I took a lot of religious studies classes, and one of my uh, majors in college was actually in religious studies. And um, I went to a secular university where most of the professors were not Christians. You know, I had one that was Buddhist, one that was nothing, um, you know, one that was... Uh, kind of a liberal Christian, um, one that was Jewish, uh, just a little bit of everything, probably. And uh, so you get all kinds of different ideas and thoughts. And, and in the academic world, one of the criticisms of the prophecies is that, well, you know, somebody uh, wrote out these prophecies hundreds of years ago, and then hundreds of years later, they tried to artificially fulfill them. That's one of the arguments that comes up uh, from time to time. And so I, was, I really spent a long time searching that out and trying to, to understand the prophecies and the specific things that were stated in, in Isaiah and in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ. And, and um, my conclusion was that really there was no way that all, some of those prophecies probably could have happened or probably could have been manipulated or, and, or you could say, well, you know, this happened this way and then somebody kind of made a gross exaggerative tie to it. So some of those things could be true. But for all of them to line up and happen, and for Christ to fulfill all of those things, and for there, there to be witnesses who wrote down uh, all of those things, um, you know, I think it, it might take a little bit more faith to not believe in the fulfillment of those prophecies. And just from a purely empirical and rational um, uh, view for those things to have uh, happened than just to simply accept 
the, the truths of, of what we see recorded in the scriptures. And so this Christmas season, uh, I know our time is getting, getting away from us. This Christmas season, I, I would really like for you to think about the big picture of what it means. Of what it means that God intervened in the world. As it was heading for destruction. As it was heading really for another, another flood type story. I mean, what happened before the flood? God created a good creation. We rebelled against God made a disaster of it all. God cast us out of the Garden of Eden. And then the Bible even said, and this just, even as terrible as the world is, it's hard for me to accept this truth, but that everything they did all the time was always evil. And so God wiped the world out with a flood, save one family. And then what did we do? Did we learn from that? No. We got right down that path, and finally God said, okay, I'm going to come myself, and I'm going to fix this problem of sin. That's why we have Christmas, right there. Just that simple truth, that simple big picture understanding. It's nothing to do with trees and gifts and shopping and all those things. I'm not just saying those things are bad. Don't hear, you know, well, our pastor said we should throw away our Christmas trees and that gift giving is a sin. And Okay, don't do that. Okay, don't do that to me because it's not what I said, all right, at all. I'm not saying any of those things are bad. We have, we have Christmas trees at our house, and there's gifts under them, and we certainly went shopping, okay? So I'd be the biggest of hypocrites if I said anything against that. But what I am saying is that there's a greater purpose, a greater meaning for what is happening this December 25th. And that meaning is some, it's not something that comes, we celebrate it, and it's gone, and we wait till next year, until the wind FM starts playing Christmas songs. We're like, oh, it's time to go shopping. Okay? It's not about that. It's about God's redemptive work. And it's going to happen regardless of what we do. Because it's not about us. But He has invited us to participate in it. We who are sinful, we who have created a world of pollution and destruction and hate and evil, and yet God has invited us to take part in what he's doing. And just like for you, when I get a party invitation or I get invited to something, you know, it, it's not like an automatic thing. I don't just immediately, like on the Jetsons, if you remember that old, the old cartoon, you know, you like get on the little platform and it just kind of takes you where you're going in your little cool little spacecraft thing. No, we have, to, we have to decide to accept that invitation to go, right? So there's a choice there for us. I wish it was automatic. I wish it was kind of like, oh, God's invited me, great, here I go. But yet, we have a choice. And this Christmas season, I would like to challenge you to examine for yourself. What does this holiday really mean? And is it just going to be about shopping for you and gift giving and receiving? Or is it going to be about something more? Let me ask you one question further. I mentioned the, the story about my kids and I and Stephanie and our hopes to plant a bunch of oak trees that will outlast us, hopefully, by many generations. And that sounds nice, but, you know, really at the end of the day, it's just trees. But there are things that outlast us that are significant, that have meaning. There are things that for hundreds and thousands of years to come, if the Lord doesn't return and the world doesn't end, that will have a lasting impact. And, and it starts with us. See, we're the seed. Sometimes we forget that we are that seed. You know, when we were uh, cutting down that oak tree, a lot of stuff we just threw into the burn pile. You know, things that were rotted or just little twigs and branches and leaves and things. They just got thrown in. A lot of those seeds got thrown into that bird burn pile, and they're never going to do anything. They're just going to burn up and turn into the ground. Nothing will come of them. But the seeds that get planted in the good soil and they get rain and sunlight, over time they will grow to be something great. And God wants that for each of us. He wants us to leave a legacy that goes on. And the time of choice for that legacy isn't, well, when I get older, 
when I have kids, when I have grandkids, when I have great grandkids, or when I, right before I die, that moment is right now. This is the seed planting moment. And those that are in this room that have a little bit of gray hair, they could probably share a testimony for us of all the best plans and all the dreams that they had when they were young. And that some of those came true, but some of them, they didn't come true because they failed to act at the, the moment that they did. I was uh, reading on USA Today yesterday uh, there was an article and it was basically about the most successful businessmen and the choices that they made or didn't make that led them into you know business hall of fame or whatever and i know that one thing that i noticed that they all had in common was that they all acted decisively in a moment of great choice they acted decisively and in that moment if they would have failed to act company or their business or whatever, it would have never came of anything. For example, Excite had the chance to buy Google for $750,000. Google's now a $340 or $340 billion company. But they didn't act decisively. They passed it up. And those choices like that come to each of us. And this Christmas season is, is yet another opportunity that has come. Will you act decisively? Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for these friends, family, that they have come to worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I thank you, Lord, for the good that is in the world, for the light that does shine in the darkness of greed and hate and selfishness. And I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place and we go some will travel other places. Some will celebrate Christmas here with their families. But I pray, Lord, wherever we go, that we would shine that light and that we would let change happen, that we would leave a legacy that will stand the test of time. God, I thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross for our sin. I thank you for Mary and Joseph and for all the, the players in the story that we've talked about today for the choices that were made to be a part of your plan. And I pray today, Lord, that we would be a part of that plan. That we would humble ourselves and that we would, we would look to see where you're at work and that we would come and join you in that place, regardless of the cost. And we just thank you and ask it in Jesus' name. All right, I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas.